Okay, so it gives me incredible pleasure, pleasure to introduce my boss, um, Emma Gottman, who I think probably is one of the most famous dermatologists in the world, certainly the most famous female dermatologist in the world. And, uh, and she's going to talk about what's new in atopic dermatitis, and we're privileged to have her here. And just like Brian, she has a gazillion grants and, and, and wonderful new faculty she's recruited to make wonderful scientific discoveries. So without further ado, Emma. Please. Did I embarrass you enough? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say it gives me great pleasure to be in a department with people, luminaries like Alice and Brian. Hey, really. So thank you so much for this introduction. And I'm really excited to give this talk here. And a um, few years back, we will not have um, so many treatments uh, that are coming into atopic dermatitis. Super exciting times for this field. In my disclosures, I don't have any patents from any product, but I'm really excited to be part of this therapeutic development in atopic dermatitis. So atopic dermatitis now is emerging as the most common inflammatory skin disease, not only in adults, definitely also in children. 7% of the adults in the United States, up to 15% of the children in the US, and up to 25% of the children worldwide. About a third of patients, very similar to psoriasis, will have moderate to severe disease, so still the majority will have mild disease. And until very recently, there was a huge unmet need for better treatments, particularly for long-term disease control or chronic disease control. And now I think all of us agree that the therapeutic drought in AD is finally coming to an end. It would not have been possible uh, without a understanding, a deeper understanding of disease pathogenesis that I think my lab contributed to that really enabled the development of the targeted treatments for atopic dermatitis, understanding really what are the markers that are involved in the pathogenesis of the disease, not only the type 2 or TH2 immune markers such as IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, but even beyond that, and also uh, immune markers like OX40 and OX40 ligand that I'm sure you'll hear uh, more about them uh, in the coming years. Now, how are new treatments different um, in uh, treating atopic dermatitis? We all know that cyclosporine, methotrexate, azathioprine, and the original immune suppressants that went into atopic dermatitis were nonspecific. What does it mean? They basically targeted everything under the sun, and definitely um, um, steroids are the same. And when you target T cells, B cells, dendritic cells, and many other cells, you have multiple side effects, including infections that we definitely need to recognize, particularly now in the COVID era. Now, another important concept for you is to think about the fact that atopic dermatitis, particularly in patients that have more than 10% body surface invol involvement, it's a systemic disease, a having systemic inflammation, a not only compared to controls, but even compared to patients with psoriasis. And when I talk about increased systemic inflammation, what does it mean? Increases in T cells, B cells, and circulatory cytokines in the circulation, including those associated with cardiovascular markers. And very elegant uh, work from uh, Jonathan Silverberg and others showed uh, in population-based studies also increased cardiovascular disease, hypertension, heart attacks in atopic dermatitis as compared to patients that don't have atopic dermatitis. And a very nice work from Benjamin Unger from Mount Sinai showed using a novel technique, PET-MR, not PET-CT, PET-MR, he showed in patients with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis increased a vascular inflammation in the aorta and the carotid and um, that is very important to keep in mind. So you need to keep in mind that patients that you see with significant disease, they need systemic treatment. So what's new in the pipeline for atopic dermatitis patients? And I tried to condense as much as I could, but this is not everything. So a few years back, we will not have anything. In fact, when I started my uh, road in atopic dermatitis, it was very sad. Everybody was in the psoriasis uh, uh, lecture halls. Nobody wanted to come to the atopic dermatitis uh, lectures because there was nothing. But now uh, we all agree it really changed. And there are many more than what you see here, but there are several IL-13 antagonists, 
um, another IL-4 receptor antagonist and um, OX40s and many others, and some exciting um, uh, new oral medications that are also being developed, such as a CCR4 and uh, others. And there are, of course, some that failed atopic dermatitis studies, including um, IL-17, IL-17C, IL-5, um, and uh, IL-33, and some others. And these are important, too, because they really narrow down what is the pathogenesis for atopic dermatitis. So uh, we can't start any lecture on treatments for atopic dermatitis without talking about dupilumab that really opened the door to all the therapeutic development that is ongoing in atopic dermatitis. And dupilumab is the first targeted therapy that went to, into atopic dermatitis. And that's a new um, a type of medications that really target one immune a cytokine or one immune axis. Dupilumab targets IL-4 and IL-13, and IL-4 and IL-13 are really important in the barrier function. They have many uh, effects on the barrier, inhibiting uh, uh, cloudings and um, other barrier uh, molecules in atopic dermatitis, lipids, and many others. And um, these are a, a new data in, in the children. You know that now dupilumab is approved in children, adolescents, basically all age groups, starting in infants. So this is the pediatric data that um, a, the study was in severe atopic dermatitis patients, a 6 to 11 year old. Pay attention how severe are the patients, a body surface area higher than 50%. And many of these uh, children already at that age have uh, comorbidities. Pay attention to the easy score. And clear-cut data, sorry, the IgA01 and the easy 75 is um, not shown here, but on the left side you have the IgA01 and the easy 75 is on the right side. So clear-cut data, highly significant compared to placebo. Uh, importantly, when we evaluate a drug, we need to think about how long-term uh, treatment with this drug uh, will be, if it maintains efficacy or increases efficacy even. And here you see not only it maintains efficacy, but there is increased efficacy in real life with dupilumab. This is really important to us. Uh, we gain more efficacy over time in both adolescents and children. It's a real-life situation, so for sure they were using also topicals, but quite impressive data. What about safety? We know dupilumab is a really safe drug. A risk of infections is very similar to adults. In fact, some studies show decreased infections with dupilumab compared to placebo. And we see very similar to adults a hint of conjunctivitis. And we see that also in the patients we treat, both pediatric, adolescents, and adults, they do have conjunctivitis. I will say it's around 15% in my clinic. Uh, usually it's uh, improved if you tell the patients to use lubricating eye drops, but still some patients, we need to tell them maybe to use dupilumab every three weeks rather than every two weeks if it gets uh, severe. Very few patients needed to discontinue dupilumab due to the conjunctivitis. And this is the uh, six months to five years of uh, age. Um, uh, we, we have quite a few patients treated with dupilumab in this age group. Um, and again, clear-cut data in terms of the IgA01 and EZ75. And pay attention also to a, a hint of decreased infections in this group. Now, what about targeting IL-13? I think an important question is, IL-13 inhibition enough to control atopic dermatitis, or do we really need to inhibit both cytokines, IL-4 and IL-13? And we need to remember IL-13 is really important, again, for the barrier disruption in atopic dermatitis and the inhibition of terminal differentiation, again, cloudings, filagrin, and uh, lipids. And I think we got our answer, our definitive answer, from uh, the studies done with lebrikizumab, uh, one of the um, IL-13 antagonists. And here are the two phase three studies. And you see the data is really in the ballpark of dupilumab. In one of the studies, it's slightly better. In one of the studies, it's slightly uh, worse. But overall, we can say that it's definitely in the ballpark of dupilumab. And we see here a little bit less conjunctivitis, but there is a hint of conjunctivitis. And importantly, here is the responder analysis. The responders were followed here up to 52 weeks. 
And one important thing here, you see that patients were controlled not only every two weeks, but also every four weeks. And that will allow us some flexibility of dosing, um, giving patients every four weeks a uh, medication. Here you see a conjunctivitis signal um, similar to the pilumab, 14, 15% in the 52 week study. Trelokinumab, also, it kicks in a little bit slower, but pay attention that it increases efficacy and sustains efficacy over time with really high efficacy levels at week 56. Pay attention to easy 90 results, quite impressive. So another uh, very efficacious uh, IL-13 antagonist. And this is the uh, long-term safety data. Again, you see a very good safety and a little bit lower conjunctivitis than expected. Now, new medications, OX40, a, a really exciting new target in atopic dermatitis. What is OX40? OX40 is primarily expressed by activated T cells, and a, it inhibits active, a, this a molecule from a Amgen or Kiowa, a, KHK4083 or AMG451, because now Amgen is partnering with Kiowa. A, a inhibits activated T cells, including type 2 a, immune cells, inhibiting a formation of memory T cells. And let's look at these results. A, here they took several doses of the drug in a very interesting study design in which there is treatment period A and treatment period B. Treatment period A is until week 18 with primary endpoint at week 16. And then at 18 weeks, everybody was put on the drug, including the placebo patients, until week 36, in which they were followed for another 20 weeks. Here we see that all the drug arms achieved a significance compared to placebo at week 16. And pay attention that everybody continued to improve until week 36. But what is unique here, and it's the first time we see it, I think, in atopic dermatitis, the durability of response. And uh, as you know, now phase three is starting uh, for this drug, and uh, we'll need to, to see what happens. But it brings the idea of potential for disease modification. Pay attention to the durability of a uh, response in this um, a Kaplan-Meier plot. What you see here is that with the two higher doses, you maintain easy 75 in the majority of patients. More than 90% of the patients maintain it for about 20 weeks. And I think that's impressive. That doesn't happen with any other drug that uh, we currently have. So we'll see what happens in phase three. It's not over until it's over, but definitely very promising data. Now, another important concept for you is the idea that atopic dermatitis is highly heterogeneous, and it has multiple clinical phenotypes based on age of onset, disease duration, ethnicity, and many, many others. And these involve different uh, cytokines, including IL-4, IL-13, IL-22, IL-17, interferon gamma, and here, JAK inhibitors will come a, a very handy and they can push the efficacy in more patients depending on the a phenotype of the patients. And I want to show you several studies. This is with a upadicitinib. They took two doses, 15 milligram and 30 milligram, a, a, that both are approved, as you know. And here, pay attention to the easy 90. So JAK inhibitors really can push the efficacy when we are talking about easy 90 or easy 100. A very impressive data, and impressively, it doesn't stop to uh, improve. You see even continuous improvement uh, towards week 52. We don't see much difference, interestingly enough, between the 15 and 30, so maybe the 15 is the sweet spot here. What about safety? With JAK inhibitors, we do pay some price. Uh, but we see that the week 52 safety is not very different than the week 16 safety. So there is a signal of acne, upper respiratory infections, uh, increased CPK and headache. Uh, and the same uh, very nice data we see also with abrocytinib, another JAK1 from Pfizer. Pay attention also very high levels of EZ90. Here we do see some difference between the doses. Um, so if you want the patient to improve uh, more, sometimes you do need to increase to the 200 uh, milligram. And when you look at the safety, 
It's similar, but pay attention that acne is much a lower a signal here. So if you have an adolescent that developed acne on upadicitinib, you can still switch to abrocitinib. Both have very high level of efficacy in clinical practice. And a topical JAK inhibitor, ruxolitinib, very a high level of efficacy. I believe that all of you are using it already. A really great drug, and I use it sometimes together with some systemic medications when the patient did not improve enough and before I switch it to another uh, treatment. And some new treatments that are coming, a topical Tapinarov, that's an AHR modulator. Also, most of the arms achieved success, significant success, and also maintained it for another four weeks. It's also coming, it's finishing phase three now. And also topical Roflumilast, a, a PDE4 a, inhibitor, also very nice data with two press releases, this one from November, and there was another one a, quite recent of both a phase three studies that were successful. And both drugs are approved now for psoriasis, and we are really anticipating their approval in atopic dermatitis. So I want to end my talk very briefly uh, talking about how do we develop a less invasive means to study uh, atopic dermatitis that is particularly important, for example, in children and when we need to sample a patient's longitudinally. So we adapted a tape strip technique from uh, studies of melanoma to study inflammatory skin diseases. And when you evaluate patients with tape strips, you get to the stratum granulosum, and the benefits are it's non-invasive, scarless, and really painless. And we are doing it now in multiple studies uh, with treatment and without treatment. And uh, we started with this study, that was one of the first ones, in which we showed that when you compare psoriasis and atopic dermatitis using tape strips, you find a very similar phenotype with multiple uh, genes that were differentially expressed between uh, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, and controls using the same criteria like in uh, skin biopsies, such as IL-17 being differentially expressed in psoriasis and IL-13 in atopic dermatitis and OX-14 in atopic dermatitis and CCL-17. And we moved to study children, and we did that together with Amy Paller, and pay attention that the same genes that we know from skin biopsies, such as CCL17, IL13, IL4 receptor, and others, are also differentially expressed in tape strips. And next we ask, can the tape strips be used to evaluate biomarkers of therapeutic response in atopic dermatitis? And the answer is yes. And here I compare biopsies and tape strips. Pay attention that the results are quite similar. Uh, many of the type 2 biomarkers, such as CCL17, CCL18, CCL13, and CCL26, give exactly the same data. And we are, uh, in many studies, uh, doing these therapeutic response biomarkers utilizing tape strips. So um, I think the future is brighter for our patients with atopic dermatitis. And this is from all of us at Mount Sinai to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.